Uh, welcome to this uh, session in honor of, of Rick Green. Um, when the AFA asked Burton and I to organize this session, they gave us two choices, either to put together a real session with real papers, or to have like a panel discussion where we will chat about Rick's many contributions. And it's pretty clear what Rick would have preferred. So we're gonna have three real papers with real discussants. We're gonna talk about uh, academic research. He's gonna be uh, very happy to uh, know that we uh, put together this session so that we have three papers that cover different, or the main contributions that Rick did to um, the finance literature. And we also were able to put together a session where you know, the, uh, the participants are all um, uh, people who, 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 who uh, highlight the many contributions that Rick did to the profession. They are some of his uh, former PhD students, some of his uh, former co-authors, and they're all uh, uh, his great friends. So uh, we'll start with Ron Jamarino, who will present uh, his paper on taxes, which is um, an area where Rick contributed. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much. It's, it's indeed a, just a tremendous honor to, to be here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Vincent and Burton for uh, allowing me to participate in this. Um, it, 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 we've had uh, such a long-standing relationship with Rick. In fact, I know Carnegie thinks that he works for Carnegie, but in, no one knows this, but we actually has been on uh, the staff at UBC for the last 30 years. <laughs> His loyalty was questioned a little bit when he, he lured Burton back to Carnegie, but we continued. Uh, I first got to know Rick a long time ago when uh, he came to visit. He accepted an, um, an invitation to be a visiting summer scholar, and he rented Espen Equal's house, which was a block away from my house. So he and I would walk to and from. It's about a 40-minute walk through the forest, and we'd walk home from the forest. And, and the things about Rick that, that are endearing among many are uh, as we all know, he loved the great outdoors. So we'd walk through this forest and he'd comment on the forest. The other thing that I think was really powerful was th what he loved doing was understanding things through dialogue with others. So we would talk and he'd be asking me about this paper or that and then we'd argue about whatever was going on. So I, th I think, you know, <clears throat> Rick was a leader in so many ways, but one of the ways that was very important to me was he was a leader in showing us that this really is about a community. So he really was a member of the UBC faculty in some way, and probably every faculty that he's ever touched. It was not about his ego or, or, or who got credit for something, but it was about understanding things collectively. Uh, in one of his last uh, visits to the UBC summer conference, he and I compared notes on the profession, and, and we wondered, is this changing? You know, are people just going in to work less, and are they worried more about their careers? So I think a lasting tribute is to make sure that doesn't happen. I think that's what, to, to me, Rick was, was, most, was about. Uh, so this paper is with Jack Favaloukas, uh, my colleague at UBC, who is here to answer all the empirical questions, and Jose Pizarro, who is uh, one of our PhD students, and it deals with tax loss carry forwards. So taxes are among the most studied imperfections in finance, of course. Tax loss carry forwards, or sometimes net operating losses, are a bit less applied. But there are some examples of, of where we've seen applications in there in, in things like uh, investment. There's been quite a bit of discussion of that. Capital structure, some great contributions. Incentives to file for bankruptcy, estimating the marginal tax rate, risk management, incentives to merge. So all pretty straight corporate <coughs> applications. Green and Talmor uh, have, a, have a contribution in this area. They don't talk specifically about tax loss carry forward, but about the role of, of deductions and how that creates this convex claim against the firm, which has risk uh, mitigating effects and also affects incentives to, to risk shift. So <clears throat> the paper that, that we're gonna talk about today is um, about tax loss carry forwards and returns. And in some ways, I think this is an extension of the ideas that are in Burke, Green, and Nike and other literatures that, that I've been interested in where we're looking at corporate decisions and the implications of, uh, uh, for those things on risk and how they show up in, in returns. And I think that's an important area because it brings together corporate and asset pricing, which will enhance our ability, I think, to test models. So uh, the actual, the relationship between tax loss carry forward specifically and returns, to the best of our knowledge, has not been directly studied be before. There are a couple of papers that have looked indirectly through the effect on the tax rate. <coughs> and um, so Schiller, who is a, a Carnegie PhD student on the market this year, has a paper, um, 
that looks at the average tax rates and returns. And in the accounting literature, Lev and Nissim uh, have looked at how that relates to things like growth. But nobody's directly looked at whether or not uh, it relates to, um, re uh, to returns. So our research plan is to build on this idea that taxes uh, are, are a call, that the, the tax claim itself is a call on the underlying as asset, which is the taxes of the firm. But another way of writing that, which is sort of at the heart of what we find, is that you, know, you, could, you could use uh, put call parity to show that it's really equal. A short call is like a bond, an underlying asset, and uh, being on short the underlying and short the put. And that has some different implications. So we show that risk is non-monotonic in the tax loss carry forward. Uh, in a simple one-period model and in a calibrated model that we think is reasonable, multi-period. We <laughs> examine this uh, empirical evidence and we find theoretically that, that risk uh, is reduced by tax loss carry forwards in general, but the relationship to the size of the tax loss carry forward is not monotonic. And that leads to some interesting implications. <clears throat> and it's, much, it's a very complex asset in the corporate portfolio. Uh, and so we're going to use uh, a numerical model to study that. And we find that in, empirically, tax loss carry forwards predict returns, um, betas, all, uh, volatility, all kinds of uh, things. And a short, long portfolio in tax loss carry forwards uh, has a positive alpha with respect to the Fama French. So uh, this is a, a graph. I just, it's not only of theoretical interest, but this is the, the tax loss carry forwards over time. And you see they're becoming a very large uh, asset over this, this period. They're 17% of uh, taxable income. So the basic intuition I think we can get across <coughs> with a simple uh, setup. Uh, so think of C as cash, cash flows and T as taxes. Then the value of the equity of a firm is equal to the value of the cash flows minus the value of the taxes. Uh, and the firm risk we can think of as that portfolio as well. The beta is going to be equal to the component of the firm value that is in the cash flow. So that's V of C divided by the value of the equity, which is V of C minus the value of the taxes. This is going to work, right? Yeah. Times the beta of the cash flows minus, so these are the tax claims that you have against, the value of the tax claims uh, times the beta of the tax claims. And the tax payments are this, this call option feature, that they're the, they're the max. So uh, the, um, the value of the taxes is a claim on the, and the underlying asset is taxes that are paid in all periods. Uh, and, and for all uh, levels of, of, uh, of uh, cash flow. What, we, what we're going to show, and this is basically you know, the whole theoretical underpinning of what we're doing, is that the beta of a company as a tax loss carry forward increases in a simple binomial model. It, it's illustrated probably the clearest in a simple bi binomial. First decreases and then, and then increases. And this is the idea of when you think of it as a portfolio of a risk-free bond, and a short position on taxes and, and a short position on the put. Uh, for very low levels of the, tax, of the tax loss carry forward, you're in basically just the bond area. So, and then as you increase the riskiness of the, of the claim, the put goes against you. So there are three cases here. This is where, where the, <coughs> the tax loss carry forward is less than the lower state. In that case, uh, all, this is a risk-free claim. Uh, the company has a risk-free claim against the government, which is equal to the tax loss times the tax percent. Once the, the tax loss carry forward gets large enough, there's some chance it won't be used. And when it is used, more of it is used in the higher states. That's the essence of this. Risk is going to go up in this area because as you increase the size of the tax loss carry forward, you're increasing the chances of using it in the high states of the world. Right? So the intuition is really captured. In this one period, the one part of the intuition that, that fails you in a one period is when the tax loss carry forward gets large enough. So when it's greater than the highest tax uh, cash flow in a binomial case, <clears throat> then you're not paying taxes. And the riskiness of the firm is, again, the riskiness of the underlying cash flows by themselves. In a multi-period setting, which we have in our numerical model, that you don't just, they're not redundant and lost as they are in a one period. As you get larger and larger tax losses, they have to go into in the future periods, and again, they're going to be applied only in favorable states of the world, right? and that's what's going to increase the riskiness. So that's what this says. <laughs> Given that I know we've got lots of people that want to talk about Rick, I don't want to take up too much time. But that first, there's three. There are three areas in this binomial, and they and they um, fit the descriptions we were just talking about. You start off, and you've got a risk-free. Basically, 
What Rick did and, and, and Ellie in, the, in, the, in their paper was to say, let's look at the pre-tax cash flows. The risk is reduced by the existence of this nonlinear tax claim. And that's true. The pre-tax is up here. It's reduced, but it's in this, it's in this uh, non-monotonic way. And that's, that's new to, the, to our understanding of this, I think. Uh, and so we then, you know, important features. We think that that one period really captures the intuition of what we're going after, with the exception of the carry forward. Right? In a one period example, you lose everything. In reality, they've got to be carried forward. So that's an important thing we have to add. The other thing that we're just starting to get our head around is, <clears throat> is the importance of all the different kinds of, of tax deductions that, we, that you have. Uh, I just found out, for instance, that in Canada, depreciation does not have to be used. You can defer it. So if you've got one of these other tax shields that's about to expire, you can actually not use your depreciation and use the tax shield instead. So there's a really complex optimization going on here that, that we do not have in our model, but it's going to have some implications, and, and um, I think it's good, good uh, for future research. Uh, so <clears throat> depreciation, interest, tax shields, uh, investment tax credits all influence the tax loss carry forward, which is an aggregation of everything the company does. Right? What's left over at the end of the day gets lumped into the tax loss carry forward, and that becomes this asset that goes forward. Uh, so we use a numerical model to examine this and we show that the basic, uh, that it fits, uh, it's a reasonable calibration and, and that our, our basic uh, intuition continues to hold there. And our basic intuition is this non-monotonic relationship between tax loss carry forwards uh, and, uh, and risk. Okay, so the empirical evidence, uh, this is a, um, uh, a regression of future tax returns. So this, we, we did two periods. We looked at re returns over the next 12 months and then over the next five years and uh, regressed it on, so the one of interest is the top one, the tax loss carry forward, uh, divided by total assets. We standardize this by a lot of different things and the results are all the same. Uh, what's interesting there is just how consistent through all these models, the significance and the size of the tax loss carry forward uh, in, in predicting future returns is. Uh, the other things, we've controlled for a lot of, of the, the usual suspects in here, but. Uh, the other new one is the investment tax credit and the in investment tax credit um, uh, uh, interacted with the tax loss carry forward. Uh, and we find that those are not significant for the 12 months. When you go forward to a six, so that, <clears throat> this is predicting returns over the next 12 months, predicting returns over the next 60 months uh, is very similar in terms of the persistent positive effect uh, over that period. But what we're finding here is we're now getting a, a consistent, persistent negative effect of the investment tax credits. Now remember that non-monotonicity, if something is sure to be used, it's risk reducing. If it, you have to carry it forward, it's risk increasing. And so what this appears to tell us is that investment tax credits are safer and they're more likely to be used than uh, tax loss carry forwards, which, which amalgamate what's going on with the company over time. So very strong results there. Uh, if we look at volatility over the next 12 months, the predictive content of that, again, tax loss carry forwards are consistently uh, and significantly large, uh, and so are the, t the investment tax credits. Uh, and again, the signs are reversed on these two. So one is mitigating risk and the other one is increasing risk. Um, and this is over the five year where the results are, are even stronger. You know, so these are surprisingly strong overall results and we're finding the same thing is true if you look at volatilities over the five years for the investment tax credit. Um, I'm okay for a few more minutes, right? I will finish on time. We also looked at market betas. Here the results are not quite as strong, but we're finding that they predict market betas in most models. And not, uh, tax loss carry forwards is not significant when the full model is there, but, but barely not. Uh, and again, these investment tax credits do become important. All right, so in some ways we're we're kind of breaking down, there have been these studies that have looked at the tax rate. The tax rate reflects all of this, and we're not able to separate the, the different kinds of claims against the firms. Okay. And then the last thing I want to show you is just that uh, we also did some, some sorts on tax loss carry forwards, and here you see the, the non-monotonicity uh, quite clearly. Portfolio zero has all firms that do not have any tax loss carry forwards in their portfolio. So there's a bunch of firms that just don't have these, these tax loss carry forwards. Uh, and they have, they have uh, the highest return. Then P1, then the next three portfolios are those firms that have tax loss carry forwards but are sorted by the size of the tax loss carry forwards. And we see that that's then increasing. So we get a decrease, yeah, I'm almost done, and then an increase. 
And we see that, that <coughs> when, we, when we do a, a double sort on size, that same pattern of non-monotonicity uh, uh, is prevalent. And although <coughs> you know, we're not sure that we necessarily should expect this to be, it's not, it's not an anomaly, we sort of followed the field and said, well, what, what happens if you create this tax loss carry forward uh, factor. So we've got the, the, the highest versus the lowest um, deciles and uh, included that in these Fama French regressions. And the, the takeaway from this is that when you include tax loss carry forwards, so in, in the first line, two lines, we have the standard Fama French regression um, and the alpha is, is significant. When we put the second one simply takes uh, SMB out and replaces it with tax loss carry forward and we find that the alpha is gone. So it seems that we're getting some of the same uh, action from those two, those two uh, factors. Okay, so in conclusion, tax loss carry forward is a large and growing corporate asset. Um, they're theoretically linked to asset pricing moments. Uh, they have higher payoffs in good states of the world. That's the basic um, intuition that comes from that and therefore they're going to end up being, being riskier as they get larger and larger. Overall, consistent with Green and Talmore, the risk is lower than if you didn't have this, this uh, asymmetric tax, but that's a non-monotonic relationship, so that's what gives us the predictions that are being, held, uh, being borne out in the, in, the, in the data. And there's much more to learn, I think. We, we just, I, I, I always thought of these as just technicalities. Like, who cares about tax loss carry for? Is there <laughs> things we tell our MBA students, and then you're like, don't forget them, and then that's it. But it seems that they have something to say uh, for asset pricing, so thank you very much. Okay, you're, you're in better. Thank you, Ron. Uh, the discussion is uh, Bob McDonald. Right uh, before this session, uh, I saw Uday Rajan, and he uh, suggested that uh, we will force the, discuss the discussions to present without slides, just like Rick used to do. <laughs> but I think it, it might be a little bit too late for that, so uh, we'll allow uh, Bob to use slides. I was actually going to make that comment. <laughs> yeah, I, thanks. So, so I... Uh, Thank you. It's, it's a great honor to participate in this session. Um, Rick meant a lot to many of us individually and certainly a lot to the profession. Um, th there are three thoughts I had while I was preparing this discussion. Um, one, of course, is that Rick, I thought a lot about him a lot while doing this because he worked on this topic. This was an early paper of his with Ellie Talmore. Um, the second thing was I was reminded of the fact that he didn't use slides when he discussed papers. He would stand up there with a notepad and talk. And the, the other reflection I had was about the style of his discussions. Um, he, you know, it, if you, he always was rigorous about the ideas and the critiques, and he was, he was a, I would say, a firm discussant. He, he didn't uh, sugarcoat. And, uh, but at the same time, he had a style that I would describe as being like jazz. You know, you, you recognize the chords, you sort of recognize the structure, and, but, but it, was, it would go off in unexpected directions sometimes. Um, so, um, so anyway, that was a, um, those were wonderful memories, uh, both hearing him discuss and having him discuss uh, my work. So, um, so I'm uh, going to talk about uh, Ron's paper and... Um, a couple of comments, just first of all, to provi provide some context. Um, taxes and tax rates are a first order issue in finance. Most attention has been paid to the marginal tax rate. So the mar idea of the marginal tax rate is you get an additional $1 of income today. What rate do you pay on that? And it's a complicated quantity because, precisely because of these ability to carry back and carry forward losses. So you have this intertemporal dimension to doing tax computations. And, you know, you can do simple calculations like suppose you have $90 of tax loss carry forward, you're going to be earning $20 a year for the next five years. That means that if you get an extra $1 now, it doesn't do anything, but it's going to reduce your ability to use the carry for, it'll reduce your carry forward in five years, so that becomes your marginal tax rate. And, uh, and the complexity of this calculation is such that the way people normally think about estimating marginal tax rates is by doing some kind of Monte Carlo simulation 
um, to try to take account of all the, um, all the different uh, possibilities. And, and often the simulations done in a non-optimal, as Ron mentioned, these tax rules are incredibly complicated. So people don't really optimize. They just assume, make some, use some rules of thumb and then, um, and then estimate the, the tax implications. And um, while the marginal tax rate is important for decisions, it's the average tax rate that in some sense seems like it's important for valuation because you can think about taxes as being like an asset on the, on the balance sheet. And so the size and the risk characteristics of that asset are going to matter if it's a, because it's a big asset, are going to matter for, um, for the valuation of firms and for risk and for return. So um, my intuition about this is that it's easier to get a rough estimate of the firm's average tax situation, thinking about these implications for risk and return, than it is to get a sense of the marginal tax situation. Because um, with the marginal tax situation, you're asking if I, you know, if I make this investment, if I issue another dollar of debt, what are the tax implications? The average tax situation sort of averages over a lot of that. But, but I don't I don't have a proof of that. I don't know that rigorously. I think it would be good to see that verified more, uh, more particularly, uh, to get a sense of really what's going on in the paper. Um, so um, in, in thinking about the paper and trying to understand the results and also to reconcile this with Schiller, um, uh, I, I sort of was trying to organize things, and I thought about four different benchmark cases. So, And I think it might be helpful, perhaps, to try to sort of put things in this context. But you can think about a firm that never pays taxes. You can think about a firm that pays taxes where true economic income is taxable. And, or you can think about, and you can think about a firm that has no carry forwards or carry backs and can't use losses. So that's the case of you just pay taxes today. There's no dynamic, um, there's nothing dynamic about taxes. Or you can think about there being the current tax rules that we have. And you know, if you have either untaxed or fully taxed firms, the bottom line is that they basically have, they have different values because the tax firm has you know, um, lower after-tax cash flows than the untaxed firm, but they have the same risk and they have the same beta. So, um, so those first two cases are really the same situation. Um, and then if you remove the loss offset, that is the ability to use you know, to have losses reduce, have the government write you a check for, for your losses, then, um, which is the situation discussed in Green and Talmore, then um, the, what Schiller shows in his paper is that the expected return on the government's tax claim is less than the expected return on the firm's uh, cash flows. And so the firm that has no loss offset and no carry forwards has a higher beta than a firm that has that is completely um, untaxed. So, um, and then the implication of that is that if once you introduce carry forwards, that basically reduces the value of the government's claim, lowering expected returns. So, so, so the firm, so the, the Schiller result is that the firm that has more um, tax shields um, has lower expected returns. And at some point, large enough carry forwards create an untaxed firm. So you're back in that initial situation I was talking about. And so this last result, the idea that if you have enough carry forwards, you sort of create an untaxed firm, I think this is what's going on um, in, the, in, the, in Ron's paper. But, but I guess my intuition is stronger for the way Schiller addresses this and for the way Ron addressed it. So I think I'd just like to see some harmonization of those, um, of those results. Uh, but, I, you know, I mean, the algebra is there, so I, I'm not um, sort of disputing that. And then um, uh, the, in comparing the empirical results between the two papers, Schiller shows that firms with higher average tax rates have higher expected returns. This paper shows greater carry forwards are associated with higher future returns and higher future beta and volatility. And the results are amazing. I mean, they're really, they're very strong. Um, it's really, um, um, so it's really uh, um, uh, impressive. So, so I think um, the, a couple of comments on the empirical results. The, the, the first thing that leaps to mind is, is and, and I, I should say this paper um, is preliminary, so um, it, there's a lot of uh, detail that's left out. So, uh, but the first question I had was, how did the authors, how did they address selection bias? So, the the 
thing is, when you're looking at firms that have a, a lot of tax loss carry forwards, these are going to be firms that have had some problems. They've, they've had rocky periods. And so if you're looking at then 60-month characteristics of firms that have had rocky periods, there's going to be some kind of selection that's occurred because some of those firms will have gone bankrupt. And so it, I think it's important to understand exactly and really think with a lot of specificity about exactly how the uh, selection bias gets taken care of in the paper. And then uh, the other question is how do tax loss carry forwards relate to other tax shields? And Ron mentioned this in his comments. Um, there are um, a lot of different um, ways for firms to reduce taxes. And if you look, for example, at General Motors, which I just sort of pulled General Motors up at random thinking that that would be a firm that would show tax loss carry forwards. Uh, not surprisingly, um, and no, I guess not completely at random. And uh, the, uh, uh, they had, if you looked at their, their carry forward number was the same order of magnitude as, as the aggregated collection of a whole bunch of other items relating to things like health care deductions and pension deductions and so forth. So there were, there were a lot of items besides tax loss carry forwards. And, and so um, I think it's just, I think delving into the accounting on this is going to be tough. Um, it, it, this is really a, uh, th this is a, a big exercise, but I think it was an interesting, um, but I, you know, I, I, the, re the results are quite interesting. So, so I think the, the challenge here is going to be figuring out what the mechanism is. Why is it the tax loss carry forwards are, be are related the way they are to future betas, future returns, uh, volatility, and so forth? And... Um, um, I think that'll be the thing that's, uh, that's tricky. So um, th there's one other dimension to the complexity that I wanted to mention, um, and that's Section 382 of the Internal Revenue Code. So it used to be, in the good old days, when life was simpler, that if you had a firm that w had lots of tax loss carry forwards and you were um, thought you would be unable to use them, that you know, the firm was sort of just generally smaller and, and you weren't going to be able to use your carry forwards official, efficiently and they were going to expire, then you could sell yourself to another firm and they would use your tax loss carry forwards. Well, what Section 382 says is you can't do that. It says if there is a change of uh, control, then there are limits on the ability of an acquiring firm to use net operating loss carry forwards. But that doesn't mean that smart investment bankers won't come up with ways to make use of net operating loss carry forward. So, so the, the issue uh, is that if you do have large losses relative to current income, there may be strategic ways you can use them. For example, one thing you can do is if you have assets with large baked-in capital gains, you can do asset sales, and that becomes a way to use your um, your your carry forwards, and that may be something that you wouldn't otherwise have done. Um, and moreover, if somebody does buy you, there is a limited ability to use the net operating loss carry forwards. So you might see that situation, firms that have, are in this situation of having high tax loss carry forwards are potential merger targets, um, potentially going to be doing asset sales, and then there are probably lots of other things that the bankers have come up with that I um, I'm not aware of. So, so anyway, so, uh, so, and all of those things potentially change the risk uh, characteristics of these firms. So, um, so it's just something to think about, something to try to understand. Um, it is a complex issue. And so just to conclude, um, you know, I think it's really interesting to see this strand of the tax literature coming back to life. There was in the mid-'80s, Alan Auerbach, for example, wrote papers about um, net operating loss carry forwards, and dynamic decision making, and so forth. And um, and this paper and Schiller, I think, um, are sort of reviving the idea and suggesting that it's really a worthwhile. And and it seems clearly that it's a worthwhile and important topic. So I look forward to uh, seeing later versions. Thanks. Gracias. 
point in time in this dynamic application. And fully understanding the dynamics of all of these tax options that they have is, is a really daunting task. Uh, but I agree that that's, you know, as we start working through this and we see the differences between investment tax credits and tax loss carry forwards, it must be very hard. Just jumps at you like you have to understand this. <coughs> So we certainly uh, hope to get into that. A lot of Section 382 um, things that you bring up are very good. And in general, there, you know, the next thing we want to look at is there are going to be implications for corporate decisions. So the, our approach at this stage is to take these as a given and just look at what the return implications are, and then we kind of jump back and say, wow, this is pretty strong. You know, that's, that's a good starting point. But the next thing, since it's affecting the risk dynamics, it's going to affect the timing and the kinds of decisions that they make with respect to investment mergers and acquisitions and everything else. And so we certainly hope to support that. So thank you so much. It's very promising. So the next presenter is Norman Shuroff, who was uh, Rick's student and co-author, and he's going to talk about uh, OTC markets. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, Vince and Burton for putting me on the program. I think I speak for all of Rick's students that uh, I think we'll miss him very much. Um, so this is a paper on OTC markets. It's joined with Terry, Dan, and Dimitri. Uh, and maybe the best way to actually motivate this paper is with the Financial Times article uh, that uh, compared OTC markets to Wild West trading. Uh, and I think that explains a lot of why Rick liked this topic, why I'm on the program. Uh, he is from the Wild West. He loved the Wild West. Um, and actually, OTC markets have a lot of com in, in common with the Wild West. So why is that? Well, they're, they're big markets on the one hand, but they really have no structure. Like anything goes, in a way. Uh, there are few rules that guide them. This is the, most of these markets are self-regulated. Um, there's no centralized marketplace where people are trading. So in a way, these are fin sort of intriguing uh, market settings to, to study price formation, the interaction of uh, investors. Um, they're fascinating. I think that's why Rick was fascinated by them, too. Uh, one of the consequences that people have documented is there's no law of one price in these markets. Different investors trade at very different prices. Why is that the case? Well, these markets are opaque, they're fragmented, and so really you, investors in those markets face search and matching frictions. Now, as a result of this, you have lots of dealers in the market that are very important, and in this graph on the right-hand side, you basically have how this looks like. You have a network of dealers, they trade with each other, they provide liquidity, uh, and then you have customers, they want to trade, they, ideally, they would want to trade with themselves directly, but they can't find each other, so they have to go through dealers. So most of the trading in those markets is bilateral between investors, the customers, and the dealers. Now, there's no regulation, so what the dealers do if they, if they make profits from the customers, these are questions that people have been uh, uh, looking at in this market. That's the reason why the regulators also have been interested in these markets lately. That's why... We're close to Silicon Valley here. That's why Silicon Valley has been interested in these markets. Uh, they're trying to change the way this trading occurs. It's, it's, the, these securities are traded over the phone. There's no iPhone app where you can trade municipal bonds or corporate bonds. Uh, these are things that, that uh, investors in Silicon Valley want to change. Actually, Ashton Kutcher is an investor in one of these bond trading platforms, in case you know him. Um, so what we want to do in this, in this paper is we want to better understand how important are relationships that investors have with the dealers that are on the other side in price formation and in how good of prices they get. So in other words, you know, if I'm in the Wild West and I face all these Native Americans that are going to attack me, I need a cowboy to protect me. Which cowboy am I going to choose? That's kind of the analog here. Um, so who should I trade with is basically the, the question. Another way to put this is actually how do investors in those markets trade? Do they trade randomly? Uh, do they pick the cowboy, the dealer, randomly over time? Or do we actually have a phone book, a Rolodex, where they have names of dealers in there and they call them up when they, when they, um, when they want to trade? And so the second one is much more about relations than the first one. Now, if relations are important, the question is, well, how big is your Rolodex and why do you have a big or a small Rolodex? What are the determinants of that? 
Um, then, of course, the natural question is, well, do these relations, this, these, these networks, do they have any impact on, on, your, on the prices that you get, on the execution costs that you get? And to put a bit more structure on this, let me kind of put it in the, in the literature. Uh, the existing literature, you can divide in kind of two camps, if you want. One is sort of this random search and matching approach, where investors are search, matching randomly uh, for uh, best execution. Uh, in those settings, you basically get no persistence. Naturally, you keep searching over time, so there's no persistence in trading relations. Uh, and if you are an unsophisticated guy, you're probably more likely to take a trade than if you're sophisticated guys. Guys with these models, they tend to give very strong predictions about who trades with who. Uh, they predict positive assortative matching. Uh, this other camp uh, uh, gives very different predictions. So if you think about these Rolodex based models of search, uh, they focus much more on the cost of establishing a link and the value and the, the importance of these links. In those models, you do get uh, persistent relations and you do get that these, the size of these Rolodex essentially trades off the cost of the link formation with the fact that you want to have many names in your Rolodex to increase the competition among the dealers. Okay? So in those models, you can actually get opposite predictions from the first set, you can get negative assortative matching. So one thing that we look at in the data is which one sort of holds more. Now the problem with all of this is that uh, to actually test those theories against each other, you need data on the investors and the dealers. And that's usually very hard to get. And that's sort of what we have in this paper. We use information on all the trading that insurance com US insurance companies do uh, with corporate bond dealers. So let me give you the, the main results in, in just uh, two lines. Uh, so if you're a small investor, what do you do or what you should be doing? You should be going to a big dealer. If you go to a big dealer and you go this, do this repeatedly, you get, let's say, decent execution. And what I mean by decent is we estimate the bargaining power, the fraction of the surplus that you can, you can get in those cases, and it's about half. So you get a decent execution. If you're a big guy, if you're a big insurance company, what you'll do is you have a big Rolodex, and you basically go to everybody, you increase the competition among those guys, and you get very good execution. And we estimate the bargaining power, and the estimate we get is pretty much close to one. So essentially, the dealers, they earn no profits from the big insurance companies, and they do earn some profits from the small insurance companies. Okay? So let me dig deeper in what these findings look like. Let me give you more examples. So here. Uh, uh, one way you can think about this is sort of who's catching the big fish, right? If, if you're a big insurance company or a small insurance company, who do you go to, who, who catches who? Um, so on the, on, the, on the right side, I sort the insurance companies uh, by their size. Uh, on the y-axis, I sort the dealers by their size, and I just plot here the propensity of trading between the two. Now what you see is what I've told you before is if you're a small guy, you basically only go, more or less, you only go to the big dealers. If you're a big insurance company, you pretty much trade with everybody. You trade mostly with big dealers, but you trade a lot also with small dealers. Uh, in more detail, this is sort of just a cross-section, but over time, these relations are very persistent. So in fact, half the insurance companies, they trade with a single dealer all the time. Uh, they buy and sell from the same dealers. Uh, and so really, this doesn't look like random search or random matching at all. It's much more, they have a phone book, and they pick up names from the phone book. So relations in that case seem to be important. And you do, if you look at that picture, really get this negative matching, this, the negative correlation between the size of the two guys. Uh, if you look at prices, the impact of prices, relationships are very important for prices. Okay? Uh, if you plot the prices, again, the insurance companies on the x-axis, the dealers on the y-axis, uh, the, dark, the dark blue is basically the lowest prices. And you basically see the large insurance companies, they get very good execution, very low prices from whoever they go to. If you're a small insurance company and you do go to a big dealer, then you also get decent prices. Okay? Again, we estimate the bargaining power at the end. I probably don't get to it. Uh, but, but you do get decent execution. Where you really get, quote unquote, screwed is if you're a small insurance company and you go to a small dealer. And the, 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 reason, the explanation for this we have is that this happens very rarely. 
but in the cases in which this occurs is basically when these insurance companies have no good standing, they have low credit rating, and so really the big dealers don't want them, so they have to go someplace else. And these are the cases when their bargaining power is really low and they get very poor execution. Okay. Uh, in the few minutes, so let me talk a bit about the data just to give you an overview. Um, this is uh, regulatory data from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, we have it from uh, 2001 to 2014. We have all the U.S. insurance companies, all the health insurers, the life insurers, property and casualty insurers. Their trading behavior uh, varies quite a bit. Obviously, life insurers, they have a bigger portfolio to manage, so they're more active in trading. Uh, the, the property and casualty insurers, they are less active. The nice thing that we have is that we do have all the identities of everybody that is trading. So imagine a situation, this is an opaque market where the market participants themselves don't really know who else is trading and with everybody, who else is trading with somebody else. But the regulator at some point decided to collect the data and so exposed for academics now we have access to the data even though the market participants themselves didn't have access to that data. Now, unfortunately, what we don't have, one limitation is, we don't know if a phone call occurred and basically there was no deal that took place, okay? Um, really, to get the idea of how we can disentangle, in a way, the reservation values from the bargaining power, if you think about what determines trading in OTC markets, one is, is there a value to the transaction? So that's basically asking, is there a surplus to the transaction? Uh, that's looking at the difference between the reservation values of the dealer and the investor. Uh, then prices themselves, they're not the difference, they're the average of the reservation values, if you want, or the value weight weighted by the bargaining power of the insurer and the dealer. So really, once you look at the matching of who's trading with who, that tell, gives you information about the surplus of the transaction. If you're looking at prices, that gives you information about the bargaining powers. And once you have information on both the matchings and the prices, you can actually disentangle the two. Okay, so uh, in the Duffy model, you essentially get uh, these predictions that, uh, that looks like something like positive for sort of matching, uh, and the prices uh, look like this, that essentially big insurance companies with big dealers, they get good execution. Uh, if you're a small guy going to a small dealer, you get poor execution, okay? Now, you got all these predictions, we test them. I don't, I don't have time to go through all of them. Say again. No, you can, you can think about size as, a, so we're using size as a proxy for sophistication. So it, it, maybe I wasn't clear enough about this. We have all the details about size as a very good proxy for sophistication. Whereas if you have a Rolodex model, and I don't have time to go through this, you basically get that the predictions for prices, they are very much the same as in these random search models, but the predictions for the matching, the trading patterns are the opposite, okay? So, five minutes. Um, here's just some um, uh, uh, data on that there is, in fact, a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the trading activity of the insurance companies that correlate strongly with size, okay. So on the x-axis you have the number of trades that insurance companies do in a given month, uh, and you see basically there's, there are a lot of insurance companies that trade very little, they trade one time a month. There are some insurance companies that trade a lot, they trade up to 500 times a month. Now, coming back to maybe Bruno's question, uh, there is a very strong correlation between your trading activity and your size. So that's why I'm using size as, as a simplified version. Uh, we have regressions, and in fact, we showed that the trading correlates not only with size, which is one of the most important determinants, but it <laughs> correlates with all other, all other things you can imagine. Things like the type of the insurance company, the quality, the rating of the insurance company, uh, the types of bonds they trade, and the varieties they trade. If they trade different varieties, they have a bigger Rolodex, um, and they trade more. Uh, uh, so then the natural question is, how do they trade and how do they trade over time? Right? Just to give you an example, here are two ex insurance companies that have, on the one hand, very similar behavior, on the one hand, very different behavior. On the left hand side, you have an insurance company that does all its buying and selling over time. They're, it's a pretty active insurance company, but it does all its buying and selling from a single dealer all the time. So basically, it has a Rolodex of size one. There's another insurance company here that is 
similarly active, it also trades buys and sells from the same, with the same dealer over time, but you see it has a much bigger Rolodex, and in fact it increases the size of the Rolodex. But clearly these trading, trading patterns are very persistent. It doesn't look like random trading at all. Okay. If you look at the distribution across the insurance companies of how many names they have in the Rolodex, uh, this is the distribution. You have almost 50% of the insurance companies that literally just have one name in the Rolodex. So the first example on the last page seems very representative of what's going on. But you do have clearly a tail of insurance companies that have ma many names, up to 40 names that they trade with in a given month in the Rolodex. Okay. The, trading persist the trading is also very persistent, so the probability if I traded with this one guy this month that I'm gonna trade with this one dealer again next month is like 61%. So trading is very persistent. Now, which insurers have this big Rolodex? Which insurers have the small Rolodex? It's really that insurer size, again, correlated with trading activity, they seem to have the bigger Rolodex. So if I'm a, an active insurance company that trades a lot, I have, naturally, I have a bigger Rolodex. Okay. Now, you've seen this picture already. Who catches who or who trades with who? Again, the sorting uh, here in a different version. It's the big guys trading with everybody. The small guys mostly trading with the big insurance companies. If you look at trade concentration, it's really the, sm the big insurance companies that split their trading activity, not equally, but they, trade they split their trading activity across different dealers. Uh, the small insurance companies that focus on a single dealer, they literally have concentration one in many cases. Okay. Now let's look at the consequences that it has for prices. Who is getting, if you have a small Rolodex versus if you have a big Rolodex, do you get good or bad prices? The way we measure prices is essentially we want to take out from, if you just look at prices, it's, it's not a very good measure. So we want to kind of normalize the prices that you get in a transaction. The way we normalize the prices, we subtract the Merrill Lynch transaction quote, the sell quote that Merrill Lynch puts out. So everything I'm going to show you is relative to the Merrill Lynch quote. So the average transaction cost or the average price that you uh, that you sell a bond for relative to Merrill Lynch is very close to the Merrill Lynch quote on average. If you buy a bond, you pay 38 basis points more as an insurance company on average, so that just reflects the bid-ask spread. Okay? Now, how does this correlate with how big is the insurance company, how big is the dealer, how big is my, my Rolodex? And no surprise, maybe the bigger dealers here, they charge less, so my, the, the, the price I get is a better price. Uh, if I'm a bigger insurance company, I do get a better price. If I have a bigger Rolodex, the negative coefficient, I do get a better price. Okay? So if I have a bigger Rolodex, I naturally get a better price. So why doesn't everybody have a big Rolodex? Well, because having a big Rolodex is costly. Right? I need to have an, a, a trading relation established with a dealer. Okay? Uh, so if you look at these prices, you've seen them before, that's essentially uh, how this price, these prices look like in, in this map, so that the big guys get the best execution. Now, how can we put the, mat, the trading pattern and the prices together? Well, for this, let me go back to this Duffy-style model, where you have the surplus of the transaction and you have the price, which is a weighted average of the reservation values. What we do is we just uh, parameterize them as some function of characteristics and on top of that, we allow the bargaining power that the insurance company has to be a function of its size in particular. Right? Um, now, how can you identify this? You see basically from this relation is that the price I should see in the data, uh, given that the transaction took place, given that the surplus was positive, essentially is a linear function of the bargaining power and the expected surplus. So once I have the expected surplus from knowing the matches, I can basically get the bargaining power from the correlation between the prices and the surplus. That's how we identify the bargaining powers. Okay. Here's what you get. The trade surpluses, they look like this. On the insurer, again, insurers on the x-axis, the dealers on the y-axis, red is higher. The red is, uh, uh, the red is the highest trade surplus. This basically says big dealers have the highest surplus. That just means these big dealers are more cost efficient. That's when the trade surplus is the highest. So big dealers are more cost efficient. Uh, uh, it's, it's more profitable to trade with these guys. 
if you're a small dealer, you're less cost efficient. The trade surplus when somebody trades with you is small. Okay? That explains why, or that's the reason is, we see fewer trades between small guys with small dealers than we see with big dealers. Now, to match the data, to match both the matchings, the trading patterns, and the prices, you do need that this bargaining power is not constant at all. You need this to be varying a lot. And in particular, it needs to be the case that this is estimated from the data, is that these big insurance companies, to match both the fact that they trade with everybody and they get very good prices, it needs to be the case that they have very high bargaining power. So the fact that they have a big Rolodex gives them very high bargaining power. And the bargaining power we estimate is very close to one. So essentially the dealers, they're competing fiercely for the business of the big insurance companies. They make pretty much, it's almost like running an auction where they're all bidding the reservation value they extract no rents from these uh, big insurance companies. The small insurance companies, if they trade with the big dealers, they have a bargaining power that we estimate to be around 0.5. Uh, so there, they share the surplus with the dealers. The dealers, in a way, earn profits from the small insurance companies. But in a way, they don't rip them off. Where there is a ripping off going on, at best, is if a small insurance company trades with a small. Okay, so let me just wrap up uh, in, in the short time. Uh, we think that these OTC markets are pretty interesting to study for trying to understand how prices are formed more generally in financial markets. Uh, in these unstructured Wild West environments, relationships seem to be important. They affect both who trades with who and they affect uh, what prices different investors get in those markets. Thanks very much. Discussion is Burton Olifield, who was Rick's student, co-author, and colleague. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, so first of all, th thanks everybody for coming to the session. Um, um, I think it would have meant a lot to Rick to have everybody here and to hear papers, actually. Um, I was gonna make the same joke that Bob did about the pad. Uh, I would add one thing. I, I've only ever saw once use slide. Rick used slides once in a talk, and he had the best slides I've ever seen. <laughs> it was like, it was heartbreaking, actually. <laughs> so uh, I can't keep up on either of those things. Okay, so uh, I will, uh, as I sort of reflect on, on Rick before we get talking about the paper, uh, one of the things that I remember the most was in a seminar, in a faculty meeting, uh, having coffee or dinner, he could clear it up for you. Like we'd often be in these faculty meetings and half the people's hands would be going up and it would be like, I think everybody's probably been in those meetings where it goes nowhere and we circle around to the same point over and over and over again, whatever it is. Then it would be Rick's turn to talk and he'd say, no, we should do this. And everybody would go, oh yeah, and then we'd be done. <laughs> and that happened many times, okay? so. You know, that's what I remember the most. Okay. So this is really a very interesting paper, um, as you would expect from these authors. They really have amazing, amazing data, and they do some really interesting things with the data. And what my discussion is going to be is I'm going to say what I think is going on in the data, and then just some suggestions and questions and things that maybe are a different paper or maybe things I need to add to this paper to clear some of this up for me. Okay, so, you know, we have many kinds of, many securities, bonds, municipal bonds, maybe some derivatives that trade in these, as Norman said, Wild West over-the-counter markets. And until maybe 10 years ago, these just weren't very studied because they were opaque markets, there was no data, there's nothing for people to look at. And over the last 10 or 15 years, we started to get data, and over time, the data has gotten better and better and better, partly as regulators are spending more time trying to understand these markets, has the importance of the securities is being kind of recognized, like municipal bonds or corporate bonds or derivatives and so on. Okay, so this paper has one of the best data sets I've seen on this. They have about a million trades um, between dealers and insurance companies in corporate bonds, okay? And what they have 
I, I, I guess because uh, Dan works at the Fed, is they actually have the names of the dealers, which I think is rare in these kinds of data. They have, from the merchant data, characteristics of all the bonds. They have the information about who's trading, like these insurance companies, so they're not the only traders in these markets, but it's a big chunk of the trade, and characteristics of these insurance companies, okay? So that's really rich and interesting data, and it's a place we can look at lots of fundamental questions in economics, I think, right? Like how do prices form, how do people trade, how do things match, and so on and so forth. So the questions that they ask in this paper, and I, these seem like sensible questions to me, is who the hell is trading with who, right? Uh, who trades with who? Um, they try to test, and uh, I have quotes around the word test because it's not a test, but maybe some straw man models. This, these papers that come from the random search literature where you're kind of bumping around and you meet somebody and if there's gain from trade, you'll trade, uh, versus maybe what I would call a Rolodex model or some kind of directed search story. Um, and they have some kind of measurement of transaction costs. Okay, and so here's the results. Norman said these, so I'm not gonna say it too quickly. Relationships matter. I mean, I guess we're all, we're all here in this room, so I, we probably all believe relationships matter. Even though, uh, I've taught countless generations of MBAs. It still was surprising to me that relationships would matter in bond trading, mm -hmm. okay? Um, many of these guys, or many of these insurance companies, trade with very few dealers. In fact, some only trade with one for a long time, okay? Um, so it's not like this big Valrasian market. There's something else going on. To test or to see whether these models work, they try to, to see who matches with who. And what happens is these large guys trade basically with all size dealers. Others trade with larger dealers. So I guess that tells you there might be some kind of um, increasing returns or something associated with being a big dealer in these markets. Large dealers have better prices. So that might be they have lower costs. Uh, maybe they were worrying about repeat business. I don't know, but they have better prices. And if you're a small insurer, you get worse prices, okay? And so this is, I guess, Norman said this, this seems to be bad news for random matching if you kind of interpret size as a proxy for speed. So that, that was Bruno's question. Um, not so clear it's so good for the roll decks either. Okay, so I'll just make a few comments and then we can get on with the session. Okay, so I think the Random search model, it's a, it's a great model. It's very useful for understanding things. Um, but, I mean, I don't think you need sophisticated tests if half of these bond dealers are trading, or half these insurance companies are trading with one bond dealer. It doesn't seem like it's anything other than kind of a straw man model, this random searching thing. So it, it, it's useful to knock it out, but I don't think that's the main point of the paper. Okay, so they have this Rolodex model, and the Rolodex model, I actually couldn't quite sort out what the model was. <laughs> Think the way I thought about this is you pay up front, and then um, you can only talk to the people you paid an entry fee for. Is, is that what you mean, Norman? Um, that doesn't seem so plausible. Like when I talk to these MBAs that are, that are now trading bonds, they don't say it's hard to pick up the phone. Um, like, I have a LinkedIn with every single MBA I've ever taught, more <laughs> or less, um, and Facebook, but now none of them use Facebook anymore. And so I, I just don't think that th this model of paying and then it's like a commitment that you don't call anybody else. I'm not really sure that that's really what's going on here. So maybe one of my comments is maybe you can think about that a little bit. Now we might think about also some kind of more heterogeneity than just contact speed in these models as being important. And so uh, to give a plug for Artem and uh, Batchmig's paper, they have a paper where that people differ on their need for speed and some other characteristics and you kind of get endogenous sorting. And it would be very nice to see that checked out in these data. And that, that might be consistent, but I couldn't tell. The other kinds of models, um, 
so here's some other Carnegie guys on the slide, mm -hmm. is so half, as far as I can tell, half of these guys only trade with one dealer. Is it really because they, they, they can't afford another phone line? Or is it because it's some kind of long-term relationship? And we do have lots of models of long-term relationships. And in the long-term relationship model, what keeps you going is you kind of get some surplus from the transaction. And it's, it's the fact that you might, not, you might lose that potential for surplus that keeps people transacting with each other. And so I would really encourage these guys to look at those kinds of models, at least sort your data, or at least look at the one guy separately, because I think that would be really interesting. And these models have some kind of relationship between trade size and price dispersion. And so maybe you could look at that in the data to see this. So that's one suggestion I have. Okay, okay so do I have like five minutes left? Okay. So. This data is really cool. Like there's insurance companies in here and they actually know the portfolios of these insurance companies. So in the models, right, it's like in the Duffy, Garland, Owen, Peterson thing, God tells you you have to sell and then you bump into friends and then you'll trade. But these guys have big bond portfolios. If it's really liquidity shocks, you can choose which bond to trade, right? Like. Probably they own a GM, a bunch of GM bonds, or probably they own a bunch of different bonds that have similar credit quality or something. So it seems to me like maybe it's a different paper. Maybe you should try to figure out how these guys are deciding which of the bonds they have to trade and how does that relate to these transaction costs? Because that's one of the things we actually care about. And so one of my other suggestions is here is to exploit what you know about these portfolios better. And maybe we could use that to learn something about what are the exogenous shocks of demand in this thing. The other question that this made me think about as I read the paper is if these guys can choose which bonds to trade and when. I don't think bonds are sort of independent things, which seems to be the assumption in a lot of the empirical work here. Maybe we should think about that. Again, I don't have a suggestion, but I think this needs some more thought. Okay. So when I talked to people who were trading bonds, at least when we looked at securitizations, and I would ask them, how do you decide who to sell your bond to? These people who are trading the bonds would say, well, the first thing we do is we find the person that underwrote the bonds, because they might know something. So I think you could also check that out in your data, because you know the names of all these guys, and you could find out the underwriters. If it's about relationships, my guess is that underwriting matters here. So that's also another thing to check out. So my last point, which I'll go quickly through, is this is the bond market from like the early 2000s through the crisis up to last year. There's been a huge amount of changes in this thing. The financial crisis, Dodd-Frank, the Volcker rule, there's been some evidence of changes in what these, like how many dealers they are. I'll show you some figures about that in a minute. There's all these industry guys claiming that um, bond trading is now being done by hedge funds and they're providing liquidity. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems strange to me to look at data like this. There's some kind of time fixed effects in here. Like, is that what you want to really worry about? Maybe the variation in time could lead to some kind of event study or some kind of variation that's useful. So just plugging in time fixed effects seems kind of dodgy to me. Okay, and I'm, here's a plot of the number of dealers. Uh, the total, this is not from such good data. This is just the number of dealers by dealer codes. So I think there's a lot of double counting. You can see it's gone up or down through time. So you should try to look at that, okay? And so I said that. I'm gonna skip that. I'm just gonna end with a positive thing. So this is a really important paper. Data's really cool. I think there'll be lots of nice papers coming out of this. There's still lots of stuff to figure out. And I can still remember talking to Rick about uh, some paper we were working on, and we figured something out. And he said, that's an interesting result. I think people will like that. And that's what I would say about this paper, right? <laughs> There's lots of interesting results. I think everybody will like it, or you should. Okay. So that's, that's where I want to end. Thanks.
by the target. Um, maybe I just want to say that we're not in fact we're probably providing support in a way that the type of models that budget is uh, is solving uh, are the right way to think about these markets. So maybe we should do more research along these lines. And in fact I think the distinction between this first generation of models and this new generation of models is very important because from a theory perspective, they actually encourage very different predictions about if the allocation of is that if you plotted the relationship that plot like you had, you'd still find that small companies could trade with a single dealer. Maybe there's something about the properties of the asset itself that the search cost for somebody else who owns US Treasuries are much smaller. The search cost for somebody else who owns the kind of ones that you're looking at are uh, greater. That might mean that one kind of market has different properties than the other. Yeah. Good question. So the next presenter is Susan Christofferson, and she'll be talking about uh, active management. Um, great. I'm actually going to uh, do a, something a little bit different. I'm actually going to save my remarks about Rick until the end, um, partly because I think it's hard to make that transition uh, from the paper to, uh, to, to sort of some thoughts about Rick. Um, but I do have to appreciate that the breadth of knowledge that this man had, you, you sort of see in this session in terms of the topics, that, the wide breadth of topics that we're covering. So um, what's this paper about? Um, this paper is about payment in the hedge fund industry. And most people uh, know that hedge fund managers receive a base fee of 2%. Uh, often a incentive fee of 20%, which is based on the profits that they earn. And they often, about 70 or 80% of them, face a high water mark, which means if they lose money, they don't get their incentive fee until they make that money back. Okay? So the question that we're going to ask, the main question is, does this contract encourage the manager to work harder? And what's the approach going to be? Basically, this is going to be Burke and Green model meets the hedge fund industry, okay, and a hedge fund setting. So uh, the setting of Burke and Green was mutual funds, and this is the hedge fund setting. So what's the basic insight that's different in this setting than what we had in the mutual fund setting is basically once you introduce an, a hedge fund or a high watermark, it creates a wedge between the people that are currently in the fund from the people that are entering into the fund. Um, and the reason is, is because the people that are in the fund, if there's a loss, they're not going to have to pay the incentive fee until the guy gets back over the high water mark. So they're going to be having some advantage. But anyone who comes into the fund going forward has to pay their incentive fees. So there's a wedge between those two parties. Okay. Um, so what's the model? There's two types of managers. There's good managers and there's bad managers. Um, and there's a probability of you being good or bad, which is lambda. Um, and it's, it's very, very simple. So there's only two return outcomes. You can either get a good outcome or a bad outcome, and there's only going to be two periods. So basically, there's four possible outcomes, either up, 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 down, down, up, or down, down. Okay, um, And all of the assumptions basically come directly from the Burke and Green model. Uh, so returns of information, there's learning, uh, funds face decreasing uh, returns to scale, capital is competitive, and this is a really, really critical part of the model, and the asset size has to be greater than zero, okay? So the initial investment has to be positive. And basically, and investors are going to enter and they're going to compete everything down to zero, but again, because of this wedge, they can never get the returns to get down to zero in the case where there's actually been an initial bad return, because the guys coming in have to pay this incentive fee, and the guys that are there don't. So this is going to mean that some positive return exists. 
So it's very simple. Date zero managers learn their type. They're going to take in uh, assets. The good types, the big decision that the manager has to make is, am I going to put in effort or am I not? And then the base fee is taken out. So then the, the return is either up or down. And then, you know, if it's up, then there's going to be an incentive fee that's paid out. Investors update their beliefs based on what's happened. Uh, existing investors are going to come in. New investment um, will come in or they'll decide not to. Um, and then no incentive fee is paid uh, if there's bad returns. And then finally, uh, again, you have a new realization of up or down. And then incentive uh, fees um, would be paid out according to the high watermarks in the second period. So very, very straightforward uh, setup. Okay, so now there's basically, there's not only so many outcomes that can happen, but there's still something interesting that can come from that very simple setting. In the event that you have a very good outcome, we call this profit, and basically you're basically in the, in the world of the mutual funds where all returns are going to get uh, driven down to zero. The, the interesting part is going to happen when there's a bad outcome in the first period. And there you can have three possibilities. One is what we call the outflow region. So flows, uh, you learn something and you say, oh my gosh, we have a bad outcome. This guy must be really, really bad. And everybody wants to leave. Okay? In which case, the high watermark has absolutely no value to you because everybody leaves anyways. Right? The second or the third possibility is that basically what happens, you have a bad outcome and nobody wants to come in because everybody still thinks, well, this is bad, maybe this guy's not so good, nobody wants to come in. But these guys, because they now uh, don't pay any incentive fees, still have an incentive to stay. So there's what we call a no-flow region because people don't want to come in, but these guys still want to stick around. And then the inflow region is basically you lose money, but you still think this guy's actually still good. It's like a Warren Buffett. You still have really good, you think this is good. And just because now the fund has gotten smaller, there's still people that actually want to come in. Okay? So you can sort of see these outcomes are dependent on what your priors are uh, about the manager. So pictorially, you know, the profit region basically, uh, you know, positive outcome. New money is going to come in, drive returns down to zero. An outflow region, there's a bad outcome. And basically, the money that was in there, people leave and drive their returns down to zero. And this is going to be because there's low precision, or people are updating an awful lot. They learn a lot of information from this bad outcome, and they decide to leave. The no-flow region, basically, nothing comes in. And you can kind of see like that old money there. And this is going to be sort of what's the big insight, is that basically new money doesn't want to come in because they have to pay the incentive fee, but the old money is earning this positive return going forward because they don't have to pay the incentive fees going diffs. And this is going to be the difference, is that this is where that wedge means there's, there's actually not going to compete everything down to zero. And then the inflow region, um, you still earn a positive uh, return in the second period, um, but the new money, even though it still wants to come in, there's still this wedge that's created between the incumbent and the incoming money, and it never quite gets down. So there's still positive returns that can sort of exist for the investors. So it's basically in this inflow and the no-flow region where the, um, where the fund... Where, where there's some positive return and where the high watermark is, uh, or the, the, that high watermark is actually going to be valuable to you, right? It's not valuable to you if after a bad return, you're just going to want to leave the fund anyways. So what's the implications? Basically, uh, there's going to be some positive expected return in that second period if you're in the inflow and, and, and no flow region. And the high watermark is only going to be valuable to the investor, really, in those kind of... And so when is it going to be valuable? It's going to be valuable when you're very certain or you're pretty certain that this guy is actually... A, you have a pretty strong prior that the manager is actually a good manager because that's going to encourage you to want to stay even after observing a bad performance in that first period. 
Um, so what's going to happen is that if you sort of step back and go back to date zero, the fact that you're earning a positive return in date one means that, oh, well, I'm going to get that positive return. What, what would competitive capital markets suggest? Well, you're going to sort of want to come in and make that asset size larger in date zero. Um, so the high water mark is actually going to create an overinvestment in the fund at the first period because of these positive returns it's going to create in the second period. Okay. So testable predictions, a manager's track record can proxy for the public's precision about the value added. Um, so you know, if, if you really know a lot about the manager, it's a manager you've observed a lot, that's when the high watermark is actually going to be very valuable uh, to you as an investor because it means if you observe a bad performance, you're actually going to want to sort of stick around. Um, looking across new funds, um, managers who have longer track records who you know more about them, uh, they should be bigger, they should have lower initial returns, and they should be, predict better performance after bad, uh, bad returns. Um, and so this creates interesting dynamics. Um, so you know, if, it, if people don't know a lot about the manager, so if the manager, then basically people are gonna leave after bad performance. If this is someone that you know a little bit about, um, basically, there shouldn't be any kind of, so the flow function is going to kind of look uh, a bit kinked, right? There's going to be this, um, depending on what you know about the, the manager. Okay, so the question that we wanted to sort of ask is, is this an efficient contract? Does this get the manager to work harder? Okay, and so the first thing we asked was, you know, first of all, does it, does it, cr cr can they actually distinguish? If you were to have a high watermark and Vincent wasn't, you know, if I had a high watermark and Vincent didn't have a high watermark, would that sort of suggest that I'm actually a value, more valuable manager than Vincent? Can I separate myself um, from other managers? And the answer to that is absolutely not. That the bad type is always going to want to copy the good type because the assets that they can attract are going to be larger just by having a high watermark in your, in your, in your, um, so th that's the first thing. It's not going to stop the. Uh... Okay, so the the big sort of question is: Does it incentivize you to work? And so to do this, what we do is we sort of say, what's the maximum cost I'd be willing to pay, in order to exert effort to distinguish myself to 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 sort of make um, improve the likeliness that I'm going to be good or not. And I compare and we compare those costs with or without a high watermark. And if the cost is higher um, when you don't have a high watermark, then we sort of say the high watermark is actually more beneficial. So we compare, we look across different parameter spaces and compare when are those costs going to be uh, greater or smaller. And the bottom line is, let's see if this works. Um, so the, 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 this is lambda. So this is that probability of being a good manager. And you can't see that back in the rows, but this is like 90%, OK? So this is saying that you have to be 90% sure that in the population of managers that you're looking at, that this guy's actually any good. And this is theta. This is the probability, um, given that you're a good type, that you're actually going to uh, have a positive return, right? There's still randomness in what you're, and so the theta here has to, you know, we're sort of, to, right here is about 75%. So what this is saying, so you can sort of see the positive benefits. This is when the high watermark is actually beneficial. It's a very, very, very small part of the space, and it's only going to be beneficial when your probability, your thought about the manager is that they're, they're actually a really good uh, manager. So what it suggests is that the high watermark is actually a very poor contract on its own to encourage um, someone to actually work harder. So those of you that know me, uh, probably this paper has been around for a while. And part of the reason is that we sort of got stuck because we're sort of facing this issue of trying to sort of think about, well, this is not an optimal contract. Right? Having this contract of a base fee with an incentive fee with the high watermark is actually not a very good, efficient contract. It's actually a terrible contract, right? There's, no, there's not very many cases where it's actually going to be worthwhile. And so we've sort of been posed with the question, well, what is an optimal contract? Okay? And this is actually not currently in the paper, and it's sort of what we're extending the work to. 
Um, so, so why is the high watermark not sufficient on its own for optimality? Um, the basic reason is because if you think about it, what would make an optimal contract? What you want then is to pay the manager the most money when there's an up, up state, right? You want to pay the guy in the very highest state of outcomes. In all the other outcomes, you'd rather just like, just make them break even, right? So you want a contract that's going to do that. Why will the high watermark not achieve that? Is because the high watermark is only penalizing you when you do go to the down state, right? What, it's, what the problem is, is it's not penalizing if you do well in the first state and then do poorly in the second state. It's not penalizing you for that. And that's why it's not really working on its own very well. Um, and so you kind of need something that sort of says, if you could do well, but then later do poorly, you want something that's going to penalize the guy for, for doing that. Um, and the other thing that's really problematic is the fact that money can enter. Because money can enter and that rewards the manager. The manager brings more assets in and that's actually going to reward them in the states where you don't want to reward them. So it's those two factors. So th this is sort of now what we're working on is the optimal contract that we sort of have been able to find is that one, you have the high watermark which penalizes the down state. So it takes money away in the down states. You have a clawback, so there's a clawback clause, which means if you get your incentive fee in the first period, there's a mechanism to take that money back if you do poorly in the second, and that's going to take care of that up-down state. And then if you prevent money from actually coming in, so that would sort of be the extension of the crystallization periods in the hedge funds. Um, and what's interesting is these clawbacks and longer crystallization periods are actually becoming more common, which would suggest that we're moving more towards kind of an optimal contract. Um, but certainly just the high watermark on its own isn't going to do it. So to conclude, high watermark creates a wedge between the expected returns of new and old investors. The value of the high watermark for existing uh, investors is bound up in the um, dynamics of both the decreasing returns to scale and the learning outcomes. It does not just seem to be a contract which improves efficiency by encouraging the manager to work harder. Um, and so the new research and the new stuff that we've been working on is this stuff on the optimality. And basically our conclusion is you have to have a high watermark, a clawback, and you can't have flows coming in and out. Um, and those three components are necessary to really get the, the managers to work harder. Um, so I, I hope I still have like four, five minutes or whatever. Okay, so this is probably the tougher part of the talk. <laughs> the thing I probably spent more time thinking about. Um, so these are two pictures which remind me of Rick. And actually I'm gonna solve the puzzle about why Burton and I are wearing these funny little red tags on our shirts. Um, so they're kind of random pictures, but they both remind me a little bit of Rick. So what's the one on the left there? Um, you know, at my, one of my first meetings with Rick, he, you know, he has that sort of very evasive personality. He quickly deducted that I was from Canada. And more importantly, that I grew up in a small, uh, mid-sized community called Kamloops, British Columbia. And that cowboy-like fish there is actually the mascot of the town that I grew up in. It's called Cammy the Fish. I know I should be embarrassed, <laughs> that I came from a town that dresses uh, fish up in cowboy gear. But in many ways, I'm very thankful to the symbol because when I met Rick, uh, he knew this mascot. <laughs> he knew what it was, and I was like, wow, you know, there's, here's this man with, you know, just an incredible, uh, you know, sort of force within our field, and he knows Cammy the fish. Um, so this was, this, this was a, a big moment for me, and, and I'm sure you can all guess uh, that fish represents rainbow trout, which is sort of throughout the lakes and streams that sort of uh, surround the area and community that I grew up in. And he, um, he has visited and fished in many of those lakes and streams. So it, was, uh, it automatically opened up a doorway for me as a young professional to sort of talk to him and he opened up many doors for me which I'm forever uh, grateful as a result. I think one thing that struck me is how his love of fishing um, permeated a lot of what he did. 
he was thoughtful, careful. And if you think about that Burke and Green model, that was the big fish. I mean, I look at the 1,400, 1,500 citations. That paper has a huge impact within the mutual fund industry. Um, and he really landed the big one, working with Jonathan. So who's the character to the right there? Um, do you guys see any likeness? So the fellow's name, uh, anybody know who this is called? And you can't say anything, Burton, who this man's called. His name is Red Green. <laughs> and um, he's a wacky Canadian comedian. He provides rather creative tips on how to uh, be the ultimate handyman. Um, when I first saw this comedy show, I, I really encourage you, go watch it. And I think you'll, you'll see why immediately when I saw this, I thought, I thought of Rick Green. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I think I spent years thinking, I should write to Rick and just say, you know, I, this, this show reminds me of you. And I finally did. I sent him an email, and, and uh, I can't remember. It was a link. I can't remember if it was the car where he had strapped on with duct tape a chair and a steering wheel, and he had created a Zamboni. <laughs> um, but it was the kind of humor that I appreciated, um, and obviously Rick did. It was a big risk for me, because here's this prominent member, and I sent him this link to this kind of crazy, wacky Canadian thing, but he appreciated it, and it was, uh, you know, he, he loved it. So this was really a kind of a delight for me. Um, so you can sort of see, so one of the things that, that this man loved was duct tape. Duct tape was a solution to all handyman problems. Uh, you could, well, you should go online and see how he's, you know, you could use the duct tape for armrests. You could create them for, make bowls out of them, uh, you know, crazy uh, Canadian things that you can do with duct tape. Um, so you can sort of see today that I'm wearing a splash of duct tape on my <laughs> lapel, red, because of the red green, and uh, Burton sort of knows uh, that this is a uh, comedian that Rick uh, really enjoyed. Um, so many of us in this room, so, so one thing is that it reminds me, the one reason I wanted to do is it reminds me of kind of his, um, that he appreciated the simple and silly things in life. And many of us have great memories as a leader, thoughtful, fair, funny, humble, inspiring, I think his ability to appreciate those simple things meant he could, was able to spread a wide net in the field. Thank you, Susan. Okay. So I'm under strict instructions not to walk around, so I'll try not to do that. Um, let me just say, Susan, thank you for that wonderful thing. And also, uh, Kamloops, for any skier in the world, <laughs> Kamloops is also closest to the best skiing on the planet. So um, I have a particularly strong uh, attachment to that part of British Columbia. Um, you know, I just want to, let me just uh, pick up from where Burton left off. Um, you know, uh, the... The thing about Rick is Burton's absolutely right. He had this ability to, uh, you know, just form consensus, uh, you know, form a consensus with his really overpowering personality, and, and in that way was a real leader. But what I also would like to say that Rick also was like was he was not the kind of person who kind of didn't appreciate the other kind of personalities in the world, right? I mean, he, in order for him to come to that consensus, he first had to hear the other personalities talking, right? And, um, you know, so that, I think that's another message, which is, I obviously don't have that characteristic. <laughs> um, and most of us don't, because it's, it's a rare person in these big meetings who can do that, right? But that doesn't mean that the rest of us aren't also contributing in our own way. And Rick would have said that very explicitly that you know that he learned from listening to other people and so i think that's important to uh think about and think but you know rick was i'm not going to say much more because i wrote this you know about five days after rick died i got up at five o'clock in the morning and just wrote and that's on the journal of on the afa website 
and you're welcome to read that about what my uh, relationship with Rick was. Um, okay, so now uh, let's switch gears and um, uh, uh, talk about uh, the discussion of the paper that we just saw, High Watermarks in Comparative Capital Markets. Uh, let me start off by bitching. Um, the, uh, you know, I have to say, I, I do this every time I discuss, but it's getting tiresome. I mean, why are people putting the tables and the figures at the end of the paper? If you've ever tried to read a thing online, which is what the only way I read papers, it means I don't get to see your tables. I don't have the ability to go to a table and then back again every time I see a table. I don't understand why you can't just embed. It's just not that hard. Um, but you can do that if you want. You can continue to do this, though. But I don't want to hear any bitching about how you, nobody reads your papers. Okay, you know, the bottom line here is, not to be facetious about it, is, uh, you know, I'm not a particularly good writer. I'm better now after writing two books. But uh, John Cochran, as we all know, was like, either he worked really hard before, he, before we met him or he was born an outstanding writer. Um, and he once said something very important to me on this subject. And he said to me, Jonathan, when you write your introduction, just remember something. Nobody's forced to read this. You have to induce the reader to read this. And that includes the referee and the discussant. So let's try to keep that in mind. You've got to induce your reader to read your paper. There's nobody's forcing anybody here. All right, so with that bitching done, let me uh, talk about um, this paper. And let me, I'm gonna, the discussion I'm gonna give is to put it into a much broader context. Um, you know, uh, let me just start at the very, very highest level. I think, um, when we look at markets today, right, there are actually, if you want to think about it, two kinds of intermediation, right? There's people direct, directly trading, okay? And that is, and there we have the car model, basically the beginning of how do we deal with that intermediation. But that's only about half. Today, the other half are intermediated through, through money managers, right? And so, for the longest time, I think the profession's view of this has been that, well, money managers shouldn't exist. Investors who invest in money managers shouldn't exist. The whole thing's idiotic. This is just another element of ir irrational behavior. Let's just ignore it. And I think that that's very, to our detriment, to our huge detriment. I think that if you look carefully at the money management industry, what you see is a very, a very well-run competitive industry where nobody's being screwed, nobody's being ripped off any more than they are being ripped off in stocks, right? And that in fact, I would say, it's more likely that our theories would hold in the money management industry. Why? Because the truth is that the marginal investor is a sophisticated institution, generally, right? Whereas in a stock, that isn't the case, right? The marginal investor could quite easily be an individual for a stock, determining a stock price, but it's, because of the flow of funds relation, so if some guy is gonna screw up the flow of funds, an institution can immediately either pull their money out or put their money in, in reaction to that, right? I think that the industry as a whole is actually a better place to study risk. So, you know, that's just my take on how I th important I think this area is and how we should really rethink intermediation uh, uh, we should broaden our view of intermediation, not to just be microstructure, but also the, the industry of delegated money management. Okay, so with that in mind, let me talk about the hedge fund contract. Now, let me say this, that the, the biggest surprise that came out of Burke and Green for me, you know, when you know you've written a good model, if the model teaches you something you had no idea of before you started, okay? And the biggest single surprise out of the model for me was the contract was optimal. Okay, the contract that looked so suboptimal, you get a percent of assets under management, turned out to be the optimal contract. Um, and then since then, it's been a, a first order question in my mind, why is it that in hedge funds, we don't see that contract? Now, I think very quickly, I, I, I uh, came to the view that I still have, which is the big difference is the assumption. In Burke and Green, we assume there's no asymmetry information. Right, and the fact that, and I think if you introduce asymmetry information, 
That drives why you see a different contract. And I think the assumption in mutual funds of no asymmetry information is actually not a bad assumption. I don't think we made that assumption because we somehow felt that was a good assumption to make. We made that assumption. Why? Because the signaling model is a very complicated model to write down, and we didn't want to do it. But in the intervening years, I've come to the view that, in fact, that's actually a pretty good assumption for mutual funds, especially in the later work I've done with Jules. You know, there's just strong evidence that managers themselves just don't know their own ability. Whereas I think in the hedge fund world, that probably isn't a good assumption. And so that's, in that sense, I really like this paper because it's beginning to really think carefully about these, uh, 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 these questions. Now, that said, like Susan, I've thought about this for I don't know how long it is, more than 10 years, and I've always been stumped because I have myself have not been able. My view in this world is the gold standard is to derive the, what we see as the optimal contract. Another way of saying that is we don't really understand what's going on if we get another contract as the optimal contract because I just don't, I think these people are sophisticated enough to know what they're doing, right? And so that's, and, and I, I've been stuck because I've never been able to figure that out. Okay, I've figured a few things out, but I have not been able to figure out why the contract looks the way it does. Okay, so in this model, they take the contract as given, okay? Um, but let me just describe to you what the ultimate trade-offs are, right? So here are the trade-offs. You have to have a pooling equilibrium. Why do you have to have a pooling equilibrium? Because if it's not pooling, the bad managers are revealed and nobody gives them any money. So they're, they're out. The only way the bad managers, or the charlatans, I'm going to call them, can they participate is if they look like, uh, like non-charlatans. Well, what are the non-charlatans going to do? They want to give a contract so that it makes it as costly as possible for them to look like charlatans. But whatever that cost is, either there are no charlatans, or if there are charlatans, they're pooling. Right? So you have to have a pooling equilibrium. Right? Uh, uh, now, here's the insight. Here's the insight, which tells you the contract's different. I'm conditioning now, now a, a, a high-skilled manager is going to be screwed by this because the fact there's a pooling equilibrium means he's subsidizing charlatans, and he can't do anything about it. He can't signal. What he can do, though, is offer a contract which is a function of ability, right? Because even though they're pooled, in a contract that's a function of ability, he does less, he does less subsidize. So that tells you the contract then does have to be performance-based. So that's uh, this far I've gotten. So it's clear then the contract in hedge funds, the reason we're seeing this contract, if my thesis is correct, is because hedge fund guys know their own ability. And so in order, they need to have a performance-based contract. Okay. So, uh, and so then the question is, you know, how, what does this uh, 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 performance-based contract look like? And the big question, I think, is why is, do we see the contract we see? That's not what they study here, but they just study one element of that contract, which I have come to gr agree with the authors, is a very important element of that contract, which is the high water mark. You know, that's something, you know, we have to spend more time thinking about what the effect of the high water mark. And, th and I think this paper does that. Okay, the first thing the paper points out is it can't help with asymmetry information. That's just the point I made. You have to have a pooling contract. Right? No matter how much you devise this contract, right, it's in the end, if there are any charlatans participating, they're pooling. Right? So that can't change anything. Okay? Uh, now, the key, though, which is not considered in this paper, is the following subtlety. Of course, the contract does determine the number of charlatans. Okay? So in this paper, the charlatans are exogenous. But as you change that contract, you affect the number of charlatans in, uh, that are in, in the world, and that affects the probability of a charlatan. And that seems to me a first order effect. Right? So my first comment is, uh, 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 it's not clear to me that you want to abstract from that. OK? So, but if you do, then the asymmetry information doesn't matter. Now, the moral hazard. OK? So, uh, uh, the moral hazard um, uh, uh, is affected by the high watermark. I'm not sure, though, the punchline of the paper is right. I think it's a function of the very stylistic models. And let me just describe why that is, OK? Uh, 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 OK, so how does this work? Um, here's the big picture, OK? Uh, 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 
in the, in the two-state, two-period model, what happens is if we go up, we get the good state, high watermarks are irrelevant. So whether there is a high watermark or there isn't a high watermark, equilibrium in the, high, in the up state is the same. If you go down, the high watermark is relevant, right? And in particular, as, as Susan pointed out, because only half the investors are paying fees, the, the investors that are not paying fees, okay, are actually earning high returns. So when you wind that back to time zero, what that means is those investors are willing to take a loss in the first period. So they have a negative expected return in the first period, which will be evened out in the low state where they don't, they're, they're paying fees. Now, what, how does that work in equilibrium? Well, the overall fees are lower. Right? Because you only pay the incentive fee in the high state with a high watermark, and you don't pay it in a low state. Well, if overall fees are lower, the total amount of rents are the same, you have to have a bigger fund. Right? Just think of it that way. So that's why the fund size has increased. Overall fees have gone down, so the fund size has increased to extract all the rents for the, uh, 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 for the manager. Okay. Now, let's now think about the, there's two countervailing effects going on here. So. Uh, Always think of it in terms of subsidies. So you, any, any contract that's out there is going to determine how much, how, how much uh, managers, in the, the, the skilled managers are going to subsidize, subsidize the charlatans. Now, in general, you would think the high watermarks would be really good for that because high watermarks increase the uh, sensitivity of your contract to skill, right? And so therefore, that would be good and therefore, they would, they would, draw, they would, they would be efficient, making it more efficient Obviously, more efficient, the less charlatans they are, right? Or the less, the less the amount of subsidy goes to charlatans. That's one effect. Uh, 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 but the other side of the effect is in the downstate, the high watermark um, uh, becomes binding. In the downstate, it's binding, right? And so there's no way in this two-period model to get out of that. So that means the charlatans and the... Um, and the regular guys in the, in the downstate face basically a mutual fund contract because there is no incentive fee because we have this thing. And that's what's causing the high water mark not to increase efficiency. Now, that's my main criticism here, which is that's entirely a function of two states, two periods. Because in reality, that wouldn't be the case at all. You'd be in, in the downstate, and there'd be a long time to still manage money Right, and you would care a lot about that future. You know, you'd eventually get back up to the high water mark if you're skilled. If you're unskilled, you're very unlikely to hit that high water mark, right? And so that's going to generate a much richer model because then the unskilled charlatans will be in a situation where they won't be able to cover their fixed costs, and they'll drop out, right? And that'll reduce the subsidy, and make, and that will increase the incentive to invest, and so that'll lead it the other way. So my view is, if you get rid of the two-state, two-period model, and you generalize it, you will get the result, which which makes more sense to me. That in fact, a high watermark increases the efficiency. It increases the amount of investment, right? So that, and so this is my main thing. I look. I want to make it clear. Uh, that I think this is a very important thing to think about. It goes with the idea this is a very important part of intermediation in the economy, and we should think about these things. But I do think uh, 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 you have to model this in a careful way to get at what the major effects are that are driving these things. And you can't do, in the two-period, two-state world here is not rich enough to get at the important uh, 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 Things that were the important trade offs in this world. Um, so let me just say that, you know, let me, I, 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 I'm going to finish it this way because um, the, I don't know, I wasn't, at, I wasn't able to go, but the, David Hirschleifer ran a session on refereeing. And if you know, if anybody followed this at all, you'll know that uh, David, myself, and Cam, in a, out of frustration at the refereeing process, wrote a whole uh, uh, piece basically saying this is how you should referee papers. Um, and so I'm going to talk about it here, which is, um, you know, part of the way, the way you referee a paper, I think, is you divide your comments into comments that render the paper unpublishable and other comments, right? And the other comments the authors can do if they want, right? But it's not up to you to tell the authors how to write the paper. And the comments on, on rendering the paper unpublishable, it's a rise and resubmit, you basically say, 
this is what you need to do. So everybody understands how to get the paper moving in the, in the process. So I'll do that here. I think it's an important uh, 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 um, problem. But if, you were, if I was refereeing this paper, I would say the paper's unpublishable with the two-state, two-period model because I don't think that model is rich enough at getting at this full aspect of the high watermark. And then if you were to generalize that model enough to get at that idea that in the low state, the, the, the skilled and the unskilled, the skilled and the charlatans are not the same. They are facing a, a different contract because of long-term things. Then I would say, yes, that becomes a publishable paper because that is an important question. And I do think that the high watermark is something. Thinking about the high watermark as part of the signaling equilibrium of how skilled or unskilled interrelate in the hedge fund universe, I think is the right way to think about these problems. I'm done. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe in an infinite uh, horizon setting. Um, it's, it's, I mean, the, the, the math behind it, because of the fact that it's so uh, state dependent on where you are, makes it very difficult to take out into the infinite horizon. But I agree with you. I can see where that might give you more uh, traction. So I think that's good. And I really like this idea um, of changing the equilibrium in terms of the number of charlatans that you have and whether or not that's been done. But Questions? So we still have time. So if, if any one of you want to share some anecdotes about Rick, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, otherwise, we can, we can wrap up. So thanks again to the uh, presenters and the discussants for uh, a wonderful job.